Hi! So recently I posted a TikTok where I was showing off my latest crochet project, which is this one. So I made a sweater, a pattern sweater with hearts, and uh, literally one person asked how I made this, and I am a people pleaser. So that's, that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to show you how I made this, but not really. <laughs> So the thing is, I really was not feeling like making another one. What I really wanted to do next, after I was done with this one, was another pattern sweater done using the same technique in a very, very similar way, but it just looks different. So this is going to be a star sweater, but as I said, I'm making it using the exact same technique as the technique I used for this one. So if I'm showing you how to make this one, you should be able to apply all the knowledge I'm giving you to make this. This is not a pattern, it's a tutorial, right? So everything I'm going to tell you, you are going to have to adjust for the size of this shirt you're trying to make, but also for the size of the yarn, the size of the hook, everything you're choosing, you're going to have to make some small adjustments, but you'll be fine. Trust yourself. You've got this. Oh, and also, I am not an expert by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> so yeah if i can do it you can do it i eyeballed everything every step is simple first thing first what are you gonna need this is the supplies list so the first thing you're gonna need is some yarn so this is the yarn I'm going with for my current project. You can choose basically any yarn you like. Ideally, you pick yarn that is machine dryable and washable because you're gonna love your sweater and you're gonna wear it a lot, right? I would suggest not going for too thick of a yarn because that's gonna make your shirt maybe a bit more stiff. So I would stick with something small-ish. Then you're also gonna need a crochet hook. Mine is a five millimeter crochet hook. USH. Then you're also going to need the graph of your choice. So this is the current graph I am working with. I do have a more professional one made on the computer and everything that I'm going to link down below along with the graph I used for the heart sweater. You're also going to need measuring tape, also a way to count your rows. So this is what I'm using, but you do not need this. When I was making my first few projects, I would, you know, write down the amount of rows either in my phone or in a piece of paper, but I do find this quite useful and fun, you know. Then you will also need a way to take notes. So for me, that's a small notebook because as I mentioned, I'm eyeballing everything. So along the way, I'm making a lot of decisions. So it's quite useful to have something to remember the decisions you're making along the way. So you're also going to need some scissors. Along with everything I just mentioned, there are two things you can also use to make your process easier, but that you do not absolutely need. So these are optional items. The first one is like cardboard to make some little bobbin things because when I am working, it can get quite messy, right? <laughs> so as you can see, I have four little yarn things dangling from my piece that I'm currently working on. So what I like to do is wrap just enough yarn for one of the stars around one of these little bobbin things because it makes managing everything way easier for me. Yeah, so you do not absolutely have to have bobbins, but useful. And the last thing are some stitch markers. These are truly optional because I lost mine when I was doing well, after I was done with this, I have no idea where I put them. Yeah, I've been using little pieces of yarn instead. This, <laughs> this might not appear to be a stitch marker, but it is. So yeah, if you do not have stitch markers, you, you can just... If you do have some stitch markers, take them out, use them. That's everything. Okay, cool. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to be doing is actually a test. So we're going to be testing our grid. It's important to test your grid because you'll be able to see what this is gonna look like with the yarn you picked and the crochet hook that you picked. 
when you make the grid you'll be able to see if you need to make some adjustments to it also it's a great occasion to get more familiar with the technique we're going to be using i'll go show you how to make that happen okay so the first thing we need to do to start is a slip stitch so the easiest way i know actually the only way i understood <laughs> and remembered how to do a slip stitch is to wrap the yarn twice around your fingers then you take the first uh, the first little loop you bring it over the second one then you take the new first one bring it over and drop it and whatever is left on your fingers is your slip stitch that you put on your crochet okay so once you've got that you're gonna want to chain 21 I'm chaining 21 because I want 20 stitches according to my graph I'm chaining one more because you always need to chain one more than the number you want in the end so you just put yarn over your crochet and then bring the first little loop over the second one 21 all right so now we're gonna turn i'm gonna work my graph in half double crochets so how to half double crochet you wrap the yarn around your crochet hook then you go through the stitch then you uh, pull the yarn through and you should have three little loops on your crochet hook and then you just bring the yarn through all of them that's it that's how you have double crochet so as you can see, the first row is just a blank row, so I'm going to have to crochet all of my 20 stitches and come back. And when you want to turn, you just pull the yarn through once, so you chain one. That's it. Then we're good to turn. And since we have done our first row, we're going to click one and uh, mark that as done then uh we're starting on our second row so when we look at it we know that we have to do three uh purple stitches and then we're gonna go for four orange ones we're actually gonna do two and a half stitches because when you want to switch colors you have to stop at the midway point of your stitch so that's one that's two and then we're gonna stop halfway through so two and a half and when once we're here we're going to grab our orange yarn and uh pull that one through all the three loops we're doing it this way because once you're done with your stitch uh with, when you're doing half double crochets the loop on your hook is actually the top loop of the next stitch so now we want to do four when we are switching colors we want to hide the tail of this this little orange yarn and the purple yarn in our stitches so how we're going to do that it's very very simple we're just doing the, the the same as usual but once we're going through we also want to be going under those two little tails so one whoa one, two, three, and a half because we're going to switch, and a half, and then switching colors. So I'm just dropping the, the orange one and grabbing the purple one. Same thing, we're going to hide the orange one under the purple one. So we want to make six purple stitches. So one, two and at this point we can drop the small tail of the orange one uh, we were only carrying this bit to like secure it into our work which we no longer need to do because that's enough stitches so that it will not get out and unravel so we can leave it there so we're at three four I know that this is a lot of things <laughs> But it really gets easier as you're going to be working on your big pieces. You're going to get the hang of it. So once again, we're going to be switching. But this time around, we are not going to be carrying the orange piece through the purple one. Through the purple stitches. Because it would make no sense. When we are looking at 
one of the big pieces I've already made. You can see that the stars are, are quite far from one another, right? So it would not make sense to carry the orange yarn through all of those purple stitches. Instead, I'm making one small ball of yarn for each star. So when we are done with the star, we no longer carry the orange yarn through, but we always carry the purple yarn through each star. Uh, you can even see that it's like kind of showing through my orange stitches because the purple is like one long uh, continuous piece of yarn. I don't know how else to put it. One other thing you can notice when looking at one of my big pieces is that I keep one side clean. I keep a front and a messy back, right? So when you leave the tails hanging, you always want to leave them on the same side. Same thing when you drop the orange at the end of your row. So you always want to leave it on the back side because when we are going to take it again to continue, it's going to leave like some small little things. So every single time that I will leave the orange hanging, once I'm done with my star, it's always going to be at the back of my work. So I'm leaving it hanging, and then I'm going to finish this row with three purple stitches. Now I am done with my test. The first thing you want to do once you're done with it is take the time to look at it and ask yourself, do I like it? Because I remind you, this is a test. If you want to make some adjustments to your design, now is the time. I know that mine is okay, so once you're satisfied with your design, you're going to take your measuring tape and you're going to measure it. You want to know how wide it is and how tall it is because that information will allow you to make estimates later. So yeah, very important. Take the time to measure it and write that down. And then it's going to be heart wrenching, but we're going to have to undo it. So you will want to cut the yarn that you used for your shape. You do not have to cut the other one. You want to cut this one and then unravel it, baby. <laughs> we're going to unravel it because having that cut and unraveled, we're going to know how much yarn we're going to need to cut every time for each shape for one bobbin. So heart wrenching, but very important. So yeah, that's the next step. Once that's done, we're gonna be ready to start on the big thing. This is the sweater construction that I'm going with. So we have two body pieces, two sleeves, and then we have some ribbing for the waist, the wrists, and the collar. If you want to make something simpler, you can make a sweater like this as well. Actually, the, the first few sweaters that I made, I made a construction that was more like this. So it's just two very basic rectangles for the body, two very basic rectangles for the sleeves and then some ribbing again for the wrists and waist. Feel free to go with the construction that you like. Going forward, I'm going to explain everything using this construction, but do whatever you want to do. You're free. <laughs> when I'm planning the body, this is what I've got. So the basic construction for my sweater for the pattern is a checkerboard pattern so i've got one empty square that is the same amount of stitches and rows as my graph but i do it empty and then i follow it up with uh my graph i was thinking about my explanation and i realized that maybe it could have been clearer so here i am when uh when i have five squares wide I'm not making 20 stitches, I'm making 100, and of those 100 stitches, the first 20 are going to be the, the grid, and then 20 are empty, and then we've got the grid, and then empty, and then the grid, right? So 100 stitches, which is uh, 25 times, right? Right. You've got this but yeah this is how i planned it for both of my sweaters the the yarn that i used was not the same size so for this sweater i wanted five squares wide five graphs wide but for the other one i wanted six to know how wide you want it honestly 
I eyeballed it but you could use the little test that we made and do some rules of threes so you could measure a shirt that you already own and like from side seam to side seam and from the shoulder seam to the bottom and that would give you like an estimate of how wide and tall you want your shirt how many graphs that ends up being for you so if you end up with an uneven amount of graphs wide you might want to make your front and your back a little bit different from one another so that when you stitch the side seam at the end the pattern like continues on the side of your body so for one of them i'm gonna do three stars at the bottom and then two on the other one for my other sweater that i made for the hearts one i actually wanted six uh graphs wide so to make that happen to make that match up on the sides i i centered five graphs and then split the sixth one on each side there you go that's my side seam as you can see it matches up love that for me on how i know where i'm putting the sleeve hole or like how big honestly i eyeballed it i really did i planned it and then made it and then it worked out so <laughs> uh, yeah i'm not sure i can be extremely useful on that one for me it was about 30 rows high and 10 stitches in but yeah i i really did eyeball it so i'm sorry <laughs> and for the neck hole same thing but i know that for me it's always around 30 stitches for a comfortable neck hole so i planned that accordingly on three rows just to give a little space for you know my neck <laughs> my neck and collar could always measure the neck hole on a shirt you like see how wide it is and then do a, another little rule of three to give you a better idea of how many stitches you should leave for your neck once you're done planning your shirt you're good to go so there's maybe one thing I can talk to you about while I'm working on the body. First of all, you can see that I've got many pieces of yarn hanging from my work. That's why I really like the bobbins, because it helps me to keep everything untangled. Or at least easier to untangle. And you're gonna see, as you're like working on it, you're gonna develop some ways to work to avoid getting tangles, but at first it can be very overwhelming but you've got this you've got this i'm sure you've got this you've got this no worries push through you've got this and uh while i'm here it could be a good moment to explain to you how how do you know where you start the stars well you really simply combine this checkerboard planning that you have along with the chart for this star that is at the edge well i know that i started three stitches in and then i've got 20 stitches for the blank square and then like three 23 so 26 between these two stars i'm getting to the point where i want to do the the armhole or sleeve holes i don't know what's the verbiage but you know you get the idea i want to get i want to do this little thing so it's actually so simple i'm just doing my normal row and 10 stitches before the end because that's how deep i want it um i'm just gonna chain one and turn that's it <laughs> and i'm gonna do the same thing the other way around so i'm gonna work my row normally according to my my pattern in my graph and 10 stitches before the end i'm gonna turn again and that's it so i continued working on my big piece today and as you can see i'm getting to the point where i want to do the neck hold on my drawing it might look like this is a straight angle but it's not you can see that it, it it's slightly inclined so i'm gonna go to the carpet and i'm gonna show you how i'm 
made that happen. So this is like an enlarged version of what you see right here. At my largest, I wanted the neck hole to be 32 stitches wide. So 80 stitches, which is the whole thing, minus 32, that leaves you with 48. And 48 divided by 2 is 24. So 24 on each side. And then for it to be progressive opening, I just added one stitch i'm gonna start by making my first 26 stitches normally and then turning because that's simply what my plan calls for then i will be starting the next row with a decrease to do that i'm going to do half of the first stitch and then directly go into the second one to also do half a stitch i will end up with five little loops on my crochet and pull my yarn through all of them at once and that will do my decrease after that, I'm working my row normally, turning at the end, coming back to my neck hole, and will be also decreasing there. For one of the body pieces, I'm going to leave very long tails once I'm done with the shoulders to be used later when we're going to be sewing the body pieces together at the shoulders. When I do that, I leave at least like three to four times the length of the shoulders. Then I'm going to start working on the other shoulder by making a little knot like I showed you at the very beginning. Then I'm going to count the stitches to know where to start. And once I'm sure I'm in the right spot, I will just put my crochet through, pull the yarn through, and then I'm good to go. And I'm going to be working the shoulder in the exact same way I worked the other one. For your first stitch, you can go into the same one you anchored yourself in. So once you're done with your two body pieces, the next step is going to be making the ribbing. So we've got five small pieces to do, two for the wrists, two for the waist, and then one for the collar. You want to make it adjusted to your body because when you're going to sew it at the end, it's going to gather it and make it look more fitted to your body and also the rest look more oversized, which is nice. And when I'm working on the ribbing, I usually do 10 stitches wide for the wrists and for the waist and I do a little less for the collar because I don't want it super high. I think I'm gonna go with four. Once I'm done with my piece, I usually keep a very, very long tail on it. I really, really hate, you know, hiding all the little pieces of yarn at the end. If I do that, I save like one or two. You take what you can get. I do it in single crochet, so I'm gonna go to the carpet to show you. To work in single crochet, you just go through your stitch you yarn over and pull it through, and then you yarn over and pull it through both little loops. That's it. So once you're done with your ribbing, we're gonna move on to the sleeves. The first thing we're gonna have to do for the sleeves is some math to know how long the sleeves need to be. You're gonna take a shirt you already own and like, and you're going to measure it this way. <laughs> That's gonna give you how long your shirt needs to be from one wrist to the other. To get the length of your sleeve, take that total number and then remove the width of the body between the two armholes and then remove the two pieces of ribbing. Whatever you've got left, you're gonna divide by two and that's gonna give you how long each sleeve needs to be. That's gonna give you a measurement to do another little rule of three to know how many rows that means for your sleeve. Mine was very close to being the full grid height. I was like one inch off, so I rounded it up to make full grids. But if that's not your case, no problem. You can end your sleeve in the middle of, it, of your grid. Doesn't change a thing. When I am crocheting my sleeves, I am starting from the wrist, for the wrist, I really eyeball it, so eyeball it too, any number you like, that's your number. I did 60 because that was my grid three times. As you can see, my sleeves are not rectangles, they've got a slight angle here, so these are augmentations along the way. To know how wide your sleeve needs to be, measure what this ends up being because of the grid i thought it was easier to concentrate those segmentations at the beginning so that i would not have too many inside of a shape because that would like make everything more complicated so i just avoided the issue the last thing is that as you can see when we're gonna attach the sleeves to the body we're not only attaching the long edge of the sleeve we're also going to attach a, a small piece of the side 
to the, the sleeve hole that we made on the body. Since I made my sleeve hole 10 uh, stitches deep, when I'm 10 rows before the end on my sleeve, I'm going to put a little stitch marker on each side. So that's why this is here. So I'm going to go to the carpet to show you how to do an augmentation and where I place them. So I have started working on my sleeve and I am getting to the point where I need to do an augmentation. My plan is to add 18 stitches total over 18 rows. I do them on every other row. So the first row is going to be normal. Then on the second row, I did an augmentation. Then my third that I just finished is normal. And on my fourth, I'm going to do an augmentation. So I'm going to show you how I go about that. I always do the first stitch normal, but you could do your augmentation in this one as well. There's no rules. You're the designer, baby. But I always do them in the second stitch. You just do the normal stitch. When you go to do the next one, instead of making it in the next stitch, you're going to go in the same stitch. That's an augmentation. That's it. So I do one at this end in the second stitch. And then I'm going to do one in the second to last stitch. Then you just do your sleeve normally following the pattern that you made for yourself. I think there's only one of my augmentations that will fall in the shape I'm doing. So I will come back to show you how I deal with that when I get there. So I am just about to start my 16th row. Actually, I realized that I lied to you. I'm gonna have to do two augmentations in my shape. To know what's up <laughs> with this row, I took my total amount of stitches and then I removed 60 because that's my grid three times and that leaves me with 14. I split that 14 in two because the stitches that are left for my graph are gonna be on each edge and that leaves me with seven that means that if i was to make a normal row i would be taking all of these seven and starting my row with orange but that's not my situation i want to make an augmentation so that's one more stitch so i'm gonna take this one in account as well so i'm gonna do my first stitch with my purple and then i'm gonna switch to orange yeah, so I'm switching to orange and then I'm doing my augmentation using my orange yarn. That means that when you're doing an augmentation in your shape, you have to count your augmentation as a whole stitch because that's what it's becoming for the next row. I just finished my second sleeve. So if you follow along now, you should have two little pieces of ribbing for your wrists, two for your waist, one for the collar. You should have two big pieces like that for the body and two like this for the sleeves. So now we're going to move on to sewing all of these together to make a sweater. The first step when I want to sew two pieces together is to lay them flat one on top of the other with the right sides together. Then I take my piece of yarn that I left hanging when I made my piece. If I did not have one, I would do uh, a normal knot around my fingers and just anchor in that way. So I go in my two stitches, take my piece of yarn, yarn over, and then come through both. Then I will go in the next stitches, yarn over, pull it through, and then pull this one that I just pulled through, through the other one. So that's how you sew two pieces of the same size together. But sometimes they're gonna be two very different sizes, the ribbing for the wrist and the sleeve, for instance. So I'm gonna go to the carpet to show you how to deal with that. Sometimes when I'm going to go in a new stitch on the bigger piece, I'm going to go in the same stitch on the smaller one. That's going to create a situation where you're using more of the bigger piece than of the small piece, uh, so they're eventually going to match up. First, you're going to do the shoulders, then you're going to put the waist ribbing on the body, then it's going to be the collar on the body, then you're going to want to put the little wrist pieces on the sleeves, then you will close the sleeves up to the stitch marker. We put 10 rows before the end. Then we're going to put the sleeves on the body. So when attaching the sleeves to the body, you're going to do the little part here, then go across the shoulder and then come back. And then you just fold the whole thing to close the sides. Once you're done, the only thing you've got left to do is to tuck in all the little bits and pieces at the end cut them and then you're truly done so i just officially 
finished my sweater so I'm gonna go try it on I'll bring it with me to show you my mm, genuine reaction I'm filming both in French and English so exit <laughs> just so loose finished product I love it I think it's so fun so intense I love the colors together I love how like stupidly bright the oranges it like reflects on my face sometimes iconic <laughs> yeah so I'm really happy with the end result if I were to make this like exact shirt again with the exact same yarn there are like maybe two things I would do differently so I'll go over them the first one is that I would make my sleeves, I think, a little bit smaller. Like, I would use the same amount of space on the body for the sleeve hole, but when I made my first sleeve, I had not figured out yet that I could, like, predict how big I needed it to be using the body pieces. So if I were to make it again, I would do that. Another thing that I would change is the neck hole. So, as you can see, it kind of folds here, which is... Like, so not a big deal. My shirt is very comfortable, like I don't feel it. But I think on my next sweater that I'm making a collar on, I will make it a little bit deeper. Maybe I'm five rows instead of three. But my sweater is good enough, I'm not gonna like undo it. As I told you, I'm still, I'm still learning, beginner and everything. So yeah, trust yourself, you've got this. Good luck going through life looking this cute. <laughs> if you do end up following this tutorial and making a pattern sweater of your own, whether it be this one or like any other one, I would love to see your end result. So I'll leave my Instagram down below. You, if you post it, tag me, but if you don't want to post it, just like slide in my DMs and send it to me. I just want to see it. I just want to see it and like cheer on you. <laughs> uh, other than that... Uh... Oh yeah! Subscribe <laughs> if you feel like it and uh, Maybe see you next time if there's a next time. Okay. Bye <laughs>